Hello and welcome to this episode of Supporter Lounge. My name is Gemma Kirk. I'm head of fundraising here at Chicken Shed. Um, it's been such a lovely period. We were so excited to see so many of you for the Christmas show um, and tales. Hope you really enjoyed those. And we'll share some more excerpts of those for people who couldn't make it along. Um, this episode is all about lived experience and lived experience programs. So what does the term mean? Uh, we're going to be talking to some of our young people about our mentoring process here, our young inclusive leadership program, our training uh, on diversity, inclusion and accessibility. And finally, we're going to be having a chat with one of our corporate partners, Derwent London, who work with us in several ways. And this interview is about how their staff benefit from our lived experience programs. So it's a really, really lovely episode. We hope you enjoy it. And I'm delighted to introduce Louise Perry, our Managing Director. Hello and happy 2022. We are so relieved that we were able to finish 2021 and move into 2022 in what I would call our happy place, which is with our people on our stages and an audience there to share that experience with them. I'm so proud that we got to the end of the run of Ever After and Christmas Tales in a way that kept our whole community safe and wherever possible present. We were tested, but as a result of that, we've got systems now that we can feel really confident will enable us to continue to plan for performance in a way that mitigates risk in an environment that will continue to be uncertain. We have absolutely leapt into 2022, both with the projects and programmes we're running here at Southgate and Kenston and Chelsea, and our partnership and community engagement programmes, which are thriving, taking us into new areas and enabling us to share our practice and methodology in a way to support what we feel is a universal and growing commitment and understanding of the value of inclusion. So we've packed today with representations of that practice and methodology uh, through the eyes of our experts by experience. They are our young, and in some cases not so young, social change makers who are leading on projects here at Chicken Shed, the, the design and the delivery. Uh, they're doing that using their lived expertise, their knowledge and their insight, their understanding and their wisdom that they've gathered through their lived experience. These are all terms that we're using more and more at Chicken Shed to explain what we do. And we don't always spend time in offering our interpretation of what that means. So I've asked some of those experts to share their interpretation of what the lived experience means and the role it's playing in supporting them to lead on the projects that they're working at a chicken shed at the moment. I'm Jamila and I'm one of the lead tutors on the education programme. Uh, I'm Harvey and I'm part of the education team. I'm Alva and I'm a student here at Chicken Shed. My name's Kyra and I am part of the education mental team. I'm Maddie and I am on the BA at Chicken Shed. I'm Katie and I'm a second year BTEC student. My name's Jojo Morrill and I am the head of education programmes and projects. So I would say that lived experience is a culmination of all the different experiences that we go through in our life, whether it be um, family, upbringing, culture, suffering from an illness, religion, or even sort of a crucial moment that um, happens in your life. I think all of those different things that you go through in life have an impact on who we are and how we affect society. For me, I think lived experience means events or circumstances that have happened in your life. And it doesn't have to be bad, it doesn't have to be big, it can be anything that makes you who you are today. And I think it teaches you to grow as a person and to use these experiences to, to speak to other people about or even in the work that you do or in your daily life. It's all of those moments in our life where we can feel that it's affected our personality, it's affected who we are, um, and normally we overcome them. So there's something that makes you different from the day before. That's what lived experience is to me. It brings like out the like fundamentals in people. Everybody's lived experiences are unique because we all 
are affected by it in a different way. There's no one that has the same story with that lived experience. There's always going to be some sort of difference within that. I think it's really important to explore um, our own lived experiences and our own individual worlds, sort of to have an individual greater understanding of each other and our complex needs. The benefit of it is that there'll be some similarities, but they won't be identical. They'll just be similar, but we've everyone's taken something different from it. And you grow and you can change and inspire other people to not necessarily like hold on to your past and like things that might not have been good for you but once you see it and see how other people use theirs to work towards something bigger it it helps and creates change as a society now we're not standing for people talking on behalf of other people to try and solve things for other people we're not standing for that anymore we need to talk to people who have the lived experience that we're trying to either fix or create more of so we need to work with a range of people so that anything we do to better our world to better our society is based on people that know exactly what we're talking about because they've lived through it because they will know firsthand what works what didn't work so well and also that sharing on a first-hand basis will then affect the person they're talking to instead of it being um talking in i call it facebook statuses talking in facebook statuses where people just throw out these stock statements and it doesn't mean anything you need to talk to people who've experienced it that will affect your view and that's your lived experience then you'll be different from who you were yesterday so a crucial moment i'd say within my own lived experience is probably the fact that i had a baby when i was 16. um i grew up in tottenham as well so the areas and the sort of people i hung out with was sort of poverty stricken as well so uh, when i decided to go back into education when i was 17 I was then, I then went to Chicken Shed and I was around so many different kinds of people and I think having that responsibility as a mother then gave me the empathy for other people which made me work in a certain way and gave me an understanding um, for a diverse range of people and I think I brought my motherly nature to that as well as having the background of being from Tottenham as well so then I was able to connect. When I was 12 I moved from Trinidad back to England. I was born in England but I spent majority of my childhood in Trinidad learning their culture, their way of life um, and then when I moved back to England it was such a culture shock because firstly I was moving from primary school into secondary school so that in itself was a major transition. So to do it from a different country it it made me learn how to be adaptable and I think that it's made me who I am and be able to have conversations that I do with people because I had to take myself out of my comfort zone in what I know and what I'm used to and I had to put myself in a completely different position where I'm open to learning new things and I think that's made me so much more open-minded as a person it's made me it's made me still very nervous in situations to try new things but I'm more inclined to do it because because I know that there will probably be a positive result at the end. When I was six years old my parents decided that they were going to adopt. My little sister who isn't biologically my sister showed me that family isn't just about blood which means that you can love someone just in, as intensely as you love your biological family um, by just who's around you, who shows love to you, you can show love to them and that love is as real as anything else. I've grown up within the hospital um, and the like NHS side of things and it's not been like the best journey. Um, I've been in it since I was born with a very, very rare brain condition to the point where I still don't actually know what I have, it's a bit confusing. Like I've been left out of certain things or I've been told you can't do that because it's gonna hurt you or it's gonna affect you or it's gonna like set off your attack and stuff like that and it's like but actually I know what I can do and I kind of proved to people that I can do more when I had my operation I was told you can't go to festivals you can't listen to loud music in your room 
I wasn't allowed to sing, dance, do any sport and I kind of pushed that barrier and was like actually I am going to be able to do that but I'll figure out my own way of doing that and I think on that journey of trying to figure out how I can get around it has made me think that I'm not the only one that could potentially be going through that journey of trying to figure out their own way around a situation like everybody has to do that no matter how big or small the situation is and I think as I've gotten older it's kind of clicked to me that everyone needs a bit of extra support even if they don't seem like they need it like in my opinion I wear a mask most of the time but because I don't like talking about things but yet I know that other people are like that and sometimes I'm like actually I do need someone to talk to but I would never say that so I think it's kind of opened my eyes to be like a lot more like warm and I don't know the word like not direct but to just go up to someone and be like are you sure you're okay like you can talk to me and I think that their knowledge that I've been through something and that I've felt that way has really helped them then open up to me. Before I joined Shed I had um, a bit of a not obstacle but a bit of a bit of a barrier in my life because I wanted to study performing arts and um, like since I left school but no one would take me because of my disability and, and my differences and they said they basically said I was gonna fail if um, because of the dance element of all the courses but I think that feedback has kind of made me feel stronger and made me realise that whatever barriers you're going through it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't have to matter like you you are a significant person in life no, no matter what what struggles you go through. So yeah, I, I just think it's made me stronger as a person and made me realise like you can you can do anything. Yeah, in school um, I was absent for a period of time because I got really uh, ill and then um, so I was kind of like the outcast because I've been in the class for ages and academically I'm not very linguistic and mathematical so already I had like a difference but at school the difference was looked down upon and because I was like the lowest in my class and see even the term lowest why should that be a thing but so I was taken away from everyone and I felt so, I was like the lowest point um, in my life but then when you come here, it was like, just by talking about my experience of learning, everyone was like, wow, because the way I learn now, I learn it through just being and talking about different people's lived experiences. That is how I learn my own way of learning. That's built me as a person. So now, like when I go into schools, now I'm a teaching assistant. Um, I do one-to-one -one SCN. There's always a reason. You should never cut anyone off because now I know how that feels. And it's not necessarily what you think it is. They might be going through something, through their own lived experience, and you're going to be there to guide them now rather than just put them in a box. Yeah. As a result of this rich source of knowledge and expertise that we have, we've developed this body of programmes that are helping us to go further into the communities we want to be working with. So, for example, we have our lived experience self-advocacy programme funded by the London Community Response Fund, currently got 75 participants on that. Now, the, the programme enables lived experience mentors and trainers to work with others from with a similar background to support their understanding of how their lived experience is an asset and how that can be transferred into skills that will give them better access to future training and employment. 
We have our Living Letters programme, which is lived experience across the generations, creating new connections, communication and real lasting relationships. And then we have a new project which we're piloting this term called Young Inclusive Leaders, which is a project where we go into secondary schools and work with the older year groups uh, to address some of the issues that they see within their schools to do with institutional inequality. We give them the tools um, and the resources to be able to design their own inclusive projects and also find ways to use youth voice to be able to inform school policy. There's a couple of other projects that we're going to talk about later on, a Cascade mentoring scheme and also um, a uh, youth task force program. But one of the main programs that is uh, lived experience led that we've been developing over the past few years is our diversity and inclusion and accessibility training program. And I've asked a couple of the people who work on that, Dave Carey and Paul Fricker, to come along today and talk to you about what that program's doing at the moment. Hi, my name's Dave Carey. I am part of the team that delivers our accessibility, diversity and inclusion training here at Chicken Shed. I'm joined today by my colleague, Paul. Hello, everybody. My name is... Paul Fricker, I, I was a former student here at the theatre and I know I come back to help deliver the Alcultus Bias to change programme. Thanks Paul. The, the, the way that we bring the lived experience of our young people uh, into the training really allows us to deliver the actual experience of inclusion, not a, not a PowerPoint presentation that tells you what it is, but the, to experience what it feels like firsthand to enter an inclusive environment uh, where everybody can achieve. Paul, what's the importance to you of your lived experience when we, when we go into organisations, be they banks or theatres or uh, health organisations? The, the importance for me is so great because I'm thinking about about what can I bring to you and what are you going to gain from my experience and what can I leave you with at the end of a three hour or two, two hour session um, uh, are, are there any super super energies we are we are really trying to break down yeah, stick, stick about between disability and uh, disability and everything, everything, really. Yeah, it's, it's really important for us that we actually have the, the genuine voice of people representing their communities to be able to come into, enter a scenario and, and really bring their their genuine experiences there's no point in myself telling you what it's like to be someone uh, that's identified as disabled within our society when paul can come in and, and, and explore the the challenges that he overcomes on a daily basis and i think that's a really becomes a really interesting two-way conversation between uh, the people that we are working with to train uh, and ourselves. Paul, Paul, what do you hope to see as a kind of change when we've done one of these sessions? What, what's, what, what, how do you hope there's change within the organisation? I hope to see change and they give people more time to express how they feel on certain subjects because one of the things that we talk about a lot, Dave, is giving people the time and space to really show what they can do and what can I bring to you. Yeah, time's a really important element of it. I think when we're talking about time, you should introduce your film. OK, so this is, this is a film about the, the want for change and time. And this is my friend. Please enjoy it. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Very good. Red, amber and green. Red, amber and green. Red, red, red. Go green. One day, 
One day, I, I want to go somewhere with my life. Sometimes, I'll say, it feels like I'm in the car, my, with my foot on the gas. The engine is running, and I'm stuck, stuck at the tra tra traffic lights. They are always red, always red, and never green. Other people, my circle friends, go swimming past, and they leave me at the light, at the traffic light. I wish one day someone would pick me up from those traffic lights, hold my hand to guide me along the way, and say, Hello, Paul, what would you like to achieve today? I lay in my bed every night. My hopes and my dreams, they play out like a scene in my head. I wish I, I had the pen to write them down before I forget them forever. So then I think I'll tell you, my friend, when I see you again. But when you do come around, you're so busy telling me what you are doing and you're not really interested in talking to me. Why do I bother? Any excitement I might have had first like a balloon once again. I give you my turn, my friend. I have dreams and I have wishes too. Is that okay with you? And I will always be your best friend. Can I accept the same of you? I'm back in the car and I'm stuck, stuck at the traffic lights. They are always red and never green. Always red and never green. This process of the lived experience leading and informing the layers of a project has been evident on our education programme for many years. The cascade mentoring or peer mentoring has evolved as a result of having those five years of students together on the further and higher education programme. So you, you have the staff mentoring the trainees who go on to mentor the older students who then in turn mentor the younger students and this has emerged as a method graduates from that program are now taking it and sharing it with the organizations they meet as part of their outreach work so uh, schools and youth centers and they are now showing them how to embed that into their own programs so recently a group of them got together and put in an application for a research program to go into pupil referral units. They had to do like a video application which explained the processes and I'm really proud to say that they were successful and they are now one of nine organisations who are going to be delivering that research. Um, here's a clip from their application. Hi everyone, we are from an organisation uh, called Chicken Shed and our theatre is based in North London but we take our outreach work into many boroughs around London, Enfield, Barnet, Hackney, Islington, Kensington, Kensington and Chelsea and yeah loads of different places. And my name's Jimmy, I'm a peer mentor at Chicken Shed, uh, I've also performed at Chicken Shed and I've recently just graduated our Bachelor Honours degree. My name's Kyra, I am a performer at Chicken Shed, but also I'm currently working on a programme called the Lived Experience Self-Advocacy Programme, which basically allows young people to gain employability skills in order to help social change. Um, I'm Kara. hi again. Um, I am a member of a, a performer at Chicken Shed and uh, artistic staff as well as a mentor and um, I do music as well, I like to sing, it's my passion, I write here and there but um, yeah. Hi I'm Renee, I, um, I studied here at Chicken Shed and since graduating here I then led and delivered the unconscious bias training and I am now currently working in a casting directing office and I'm trying to help improve their office making it more diverse and inclusive. 
Hi, I'm Damar. I'm a mentor at Chicken Sheds and also a performer and artic artist artistic staff. And um, I also do music outside as well. I rap my music, I rap, shoot music videos, all the things I really like to do. And um, we also design our own projects here and we take them out into the community. So like our outreach programs, we actually have two now called uh, Crime of the Century and Day One Big School. Uh, crime of the Century has been run, running since uh, 2009. It's about uh, knife crime and gang violence and how the system fails young people. And we take this show out into secondary schools, people referral units and young offenders. And we also have a Day One Big School show as well. And Day One Big School focuses um on year six is tr transitioning to year seven, uh, the problems they may come across and how they may solve them issues by speaking to a mentor or a teacher or just um, obeying the rules of school. All of us have come to Chicken Shed in very different ways and if we didn't end up at Chicken Shed we probably would have had completely different lives. Mm -hmm. So it did, it did definitely change our lives. So it's important to us to see how we can improve others lives like our own. We've been really working this time um, in a Pimper Ferry in yes. Fernhouse um, and we would go there with a plan and then they would just make us change it completely. Yeah. We'll end up just rapping for the whole time and just <laughs> writing music and it, it feels it's just it kind of it's really rewarding because we do we go for a period of weeks let's say we go for like six weeks the first week they're very like standoffish Close because off. who wouldn't be mm. they've had they might have really bad experiences with new people um and then as the weeks go on it's like they come out they they come out of their shell and they and, love they and love from it. that short space of time that you have with them you find out what they want mm. and you find out what can help them rather than just going in and, and doing an activity for the sake of doing an activity. Yeah, you, you see a change, it boosts their confidence definitely. Yeah. Like you'll see kids that don't even want to participate sitting down, so we'll go to them. And then three weeks later, they're up performing mm. with us or all together. That's so. changed. And they, yeah. also, they also really express why they're frustrated, which I think um, we should all do. Mm. And yeah. being in school, I think when, you have, when you're frustrated, it's just go to the office or get out of the class, you're kick, kicking off for no reason, mm -hmm. but actually like allow them to express a real human emotion is important. It's also though, some kids can't just vocalise it, literally explain how uh, the reason why, some can't, you know, use the pen and paper. So some of that performing arts where they're able to express themselves through that is so important mm. and like people don't feel it's that significant and I disagree, I think it's very significant. In my own experience, I went to a people referral unit and I was, I'm very embarrassed to talk about it, even as an adult because I feel like people just think, oh, you're a naughty kid. But there's more to it than that and I think performing art, the fact that you can imagine yourself doing something else, is that's beautiful, that's yeah. what's fun. We're trying to get to people in a place where there's not many people trying to get to. They're excluded from a system that obviously has already given up on them in their minds and in most people's minds. They're in a place of vulnerability. They're in a place of, not I don't want to say a, like loneliness, but from my own experience, loneliness and preconceived ideas already on them we're going in there with no judgment we want to learn from each other basically mm. and i think that is something other people are not maybe trying to do but we are we want to hear ideas and opinions from people who are not usually heard i don't know about you lot but it makes even though i know what renee's saying i know already like i know what she's saying and i believe it but it still makes my heart hurt like yeah. this shouldn't that shouldn't be happening especially at a, being a ch like a young youth that you shouldn't you shouldn't know what loneliness is at this age you shouldn't feel like i don't have a say in the world what my mind what i think what my opinion is doesn't matter you shouldn't it shouldn't that shouldn't happen they deserve that yeah. kind of pedestal and that that help that they're, they're almost they're crying out for help but they're not verbalizing they're not, they're not, it yeah they are forgotten yeah. and even though i know we know that it still it really upsets my spirit mm. like i know that and they are the future and like we, they we are all being at chicken shed know what it's like for someone to believe in us when yeah, really. a lot of people they don't, give don't. Up. and i think that if we can be those people for them then that's already that's a we want to set off like a chain yeah. we want to set off a yeah a chain like a, a chain reaction yeah so it doesn't just stop with us like doing it with them and then maybe they can help people that was once in their position we want to like 
want to change. We all love what we do, and I think we're mm. all very passionate about this. Like we're passionate about our work. And we're passionate about just genuinely working with young people. Young people are. That at the moment they they feel that they are at the bottom of the Oops. pile plus they're at the bottom of the young people pile which yeah. is even worse yeah we can't have that we've got to change it like i'm getting riled up now i think we have to i think for us the reason that we're so passionate about it is because we just genuinely care like it's in our veins like we are the kids that we're gonna work we was once those kids mm. and they're not you said earlier they're the future i think you're, we're, you're right in a sense, but they're not the future, they are the now. Yeah. They're the most important people on the planet right now. And no, not many people think like that, which that's, is that's scary. Yeah. 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 This next film is an interview between myself and Helen Jocelyn of Derwent London. She's the sustainability manager there. And Derwent are a major partner of ours. They work with us in many ways. And um, you will find out more about how those ways, through our engagement activities with our young people, really benefit Derwent London staff and help to build that culture of inclusion um, and also work towards their wider ESG agenda. Welcome, Helen Jocelyn, Sustainability Manager at Derwent. Thank you so much for taking part in our Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for asking. It's a pleasure. Thank you for making the time. Not at all. Um, for those of you that don't know, Derwent are a significant uh, partner of ours. We've been working together for a very long time, a uh, long history and, and relationship of support and partnership work. Um, and specifically in the last year or so, we've been really looking at ways of deepening the engagement yeah. Uh, with staff, so we thought this would be a great opportunity to, to look at that in the theme of this webinar. Um, and the main ways that we've done that, and I suppose it, you're unique in the way that you've experienced all of them um, in a pilot sense or in its developed sense, which is great. And um, one of them is Living Letters, um, which for people at home, if you don't know, is a project between staff and young people where they're paired up and it's a mentoring partnership and it works both ways I guess, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, they exchange three letters and it's all done with our inclusive methodology and um, I suppose people can share their experience from a staff side and a professional sense and regrets and successes and so on and, um, and we'll come back to this later yes, yes. and from the student side um, they can learn from that and also share their unique lived experience. Um, and then also the unconscious bias training, which we've been doing for a couple of years. A couple of years now, yes. Yeah. Uh, and the youth task force, uh, which is a new project, um, which is um, young people who came to do it. This is a pilot session in October to um, work with the diversity and inclusion committee here uh, to inform the practice, the community of practice. So, um, so with all that in mind. Um, what did you, did you have any expectations of what those projects were gonna be like? And if so, how do you feel about them now? So because we had done the unconscious bias training for a number of years before the pandemic, as well as um, a little bit during, we knew that when we uh, looked at doing Living Letters and the task force, that it was going to be good because everyone that had been on the unconscious bias training had come back and had raved about it and had talked about how good it was. So we knew that if we, whatever we did with you was going to be good and that it was going to be carefully thought out. Um, Living Letters has been, has been a lovely thing for us to take part in. Um, and we were really struck by how open the young people were from letter one, straight in. Um, and that particularly resonated with me with the, the, the friend that I had, how open they were. Um, and we, you know, we recently exchanged Christmas cards because um, um, we had ex extended the program a little longer. And just seeing that person's handwriting compared to just an email, that that even just that little touch really hit home to us and was very special. So mm -hmm. it's been a great thing for everyone involved. Um, in terms of the task force, because it was a pilot for both of us, um, I. I didn't know what the outcomes were going to be, but I've been a huge convert to it and I came out of that session completely blown away with how good it was and what we had um, wow. had achieved out of it. Um, both me and my, and my colleague, we both came out kind of blown away, really 
really pleased with what we had talked about and we really felt we came out with some things Brilliant. for us to, to actually put in place as well as things to think about long term. So we, we've been we've been really pleased with everything we've done. You know, there have been times over the pandemic when we have wondered how we could continue engaging with people and, and, and other companies that we work with. Mm -hmm. And these have been perfect ways of being able to to keep going even mm. when you don't necessarily know whether you're going to be able to see someone in person or not yeah um, they've been they've been great things to do that's really good to hear good <laughs> um, do you so uh, from that um do you feel that there are some clear benefits already in terms of your in terms of Derwent London's diversity and inclusion agenda and I suppose on a wider level this, this kind of ESG agenda I th yeah I mean I, I think so I think um, I think it, it is that lived experience and so you may read about um, how how things are for, for other people that, mm. that um, you know compared to your own life um, but it isn't until you get to speak to someone over time or exchange letters and and you have people that are willing to be as open as they have been mm. and to share right from the start how things affect them or make them feel um, that you really get um, an understanding and appreciation and actually a renewed energy to try and do something about about things and how about how people might feel and and how you, you know it really is essential that we we make sure that every voice is heard mm. um, as I say, I think coming out of the Youth Task Force session, we came away with a whole new concept of what perhaps our community fund could look like, how we how we were perhaps going to ask people to apply, or how we perhaps processed applications. Um, and I, I, I think I went into it thinking we would just come out with a new set of guidelines or mm. application forms, and actually the discussion was much deeper about community. Um, and I wasn't expecting that at all, but we came out of that, um, and that really, really made us think about what what it was we wanted to achieve, and whether we were asking the right questions and in the right way. Yeah. Um, so that that has been incredibly helpful for us, and will inform um, how how we take things like the fund forward. It's really interesting, isn't it? That 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 that, that wasn't expected, and why would it be necessarily? And it doesn't isn't necessarily something that you think about that wider community discussion I suppose because it's not necessarily work related no I think it's also because you, you get used to doing things in a certain way mm. um, and one of the first things that we very quickly learned when we sat around the table was um, how much um, the young people from Chicken Shed listened to each other and really took on board other people's views and opinions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think actually a lot of companies could learn just from that in terms of how we conduct ourselves in meetings and how we listen to other people in meetings. There was a great sense of everyone um, was allowed their time to talk around that session and around that table. Mm -hmm. And I think things like that are really quick, easy wins, if you like, when we talk yeah. about how in ESG, when we start to talk about these subjects, how we make sure everyone in that room has some time to talk. Yes, yeah, such a small thing, but very powerful. So do you feel like that's one of the components of how the partnership is benefiting Derwent? I think so, and I think it's been one of the things we have talked about um, at our, our diversity and inclusion working group meetings in that how do we make sure everyone's voice is heard and we are particularly in that meeting very aware that to look around the room and see if anyone's hand is kind of up or someone looks as if they want to speak and to, to mm -hmm. say hold on a second what did you want to say um, and I think that will inform wider wider discussions we have mm. um, I think we've come to the end of our <laughs> Q&A sure. um, and I really want to thank you for your time and for all the energy that you put into the partnership we're very proud of it and we're very proud of everyone at Derwent working with everyone at Chicken Shed mm. and um, yeah we look forward to speaking to you soon thank you thanks for having me thanks Helen <laughs> By way of a fundraising update this quarter, 
things are going really well. We're continuing to build on the security that we need uh, to look after our young people going forward into the future and all of our beneficiaries. Um, we want to increase the number of regular donors that we have. Uh, we want to continue increasing the clarification of our impact um, through webinars such as this and continue using digital technology um, as much as we are, but also maybe combining it with in-person events again, because we do miss those and we know that you miss them as well. Um, and continue to ask, ask for your help. Um, you are our community of ambassadors and really want to develop over the next year um, a diversity ambassador network, uh, which will mean that we can call on you at any time if you should choose to, to want to be involved. And everybody's an ambassador actually anyway of Chicken Shed, but maybe it's a specific call to action every month. Um, just thinking about that at the moment. So if you have any ideas, that would be really helpful and really appreciate that as always. Um, we will be doing an appeal later this year. And as I say, potentially thinking about some sort of event at the right time, hopefully as we emerge out of this period. But um, really, really want to thank you all for your support um, as ever. It means so much. We've now come to the Q&A part of the webinar. We hope that you've enjoyed it so far. You can, of course, send in any questions and thoughts by email to Gemma K at chickenshed.org.uk at any time. Um, so we've had a, a question about the training, and that is, who have we worked with in the past year? Um, and it's a full range of organisations. Dave, do you want to answer that? Yeah, yeah, we've been working really across a, a number of sectors from kind of large construction companies and banks down through... Uh, public services such as the NHS and Public Health England and then also looking at how we work with smaller arts organisations and charities so really it's a very cross-sectorial uh, appeal to the kind of work we're doing within our training. Uh, Paul's film um, as you will have seen is absolutely stunning the feedback that we get about the film is overwhelming um, and know that you'll be reflecting on that for, for a long time um, Paul, what was your inspiration for the film? Uh, my inspiration was a feeling of time and uh, the, the, the we're winning this for the friendship. Uh, it's not very easy for a disabled person like me, me to uh, access things. Uh, but I did it uh, because when I was yeah, younger, I always used to like, like car, car, cars uh, on the other side of the, of the coin. Uh, if you are a disabled person, you find yourself uh, waiting for things to be done if you haven't got the right support in a carer or PA so you might be waiting quite a while for that connection as a friend to say I need to go to the shop or, or something so that's what the inspiration came from. in there Paul because I was listening to what Helen was saying about the value of that perspective being in a space and, and really um, understanding how the experience that Paul so articulately expresses that, uh, that, that he knows is an extreme version of what so many other people feel in their li own lived experience and, and as Helen was saying being able to bring that um, very stark and extreme experience into a space and share it with other people that have maybe layered up their own experiences of that and open that up again and let yeah. people start to, to discuss um, with their peers who they've maybe known for many years and worked alongside for many years and never approached their feeling of being left behind or isolated or overlooked or overspoken and all those things that you talk about in your film um, is a really good and effective tool for starting those difficult conversations within businesses. Yeah, I know, but I think it is really not. I think it, it, it's about finding those 
but it was in the, in the day to sit down, to sit down and say, how are you? Because I, I, I know we all, all have busy life, busy life. But if you were to, to say, how are you today? Just, just think for a moment, for a moment about the impact of being on the question. Are you okay? Do you need uh, anything? Mm. Because that's the most impactful thing you can a person of a disability can, can receive that knowledge. And you, you've developed a whole time challenge within the training that Paul has kind of created this time challenge for, for finding time to talk to people. And it doesn't, not just of people that, that, that will be identified as, dis as having a disability within society, but anyone within your organisation. And he's, mm. he's come up with a really, a, a really uh, kind of interesting and thought provoking challenge within the training that we do. Mm. Yeah, and I think that um, to what you, you've, I, I really. Uh, with that ex exercise, I really had to f think to myself, what would I want uh, from from that, that situation? Not trying try to per personalize it. I, I never tried to per personalize it. Uh, but I, I, I tried to give a, a few um um a a window of what it might feel like for another person because I know there are worse uh, disabilities out there people with no no communication um but it's really about finding the different ways to communicate what however the communication communication comes it be it through facial expression be it through facial expression um, um, co co communication is is all about what what's right for, for for that bad person in, in that moment, yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you, Paul. Um, I know that you will all be keen to share the webinar and the whole webinar and Paul's performance and, and reflections um, and insight, um, which just feels so, so vital for everybody to hear. Um, and people have asked as well how when we work with partners, does it have to be on a certain level or um, what does it mean in terms of the, the size of the partnership or the size of the company? Uh, and the answer is um, that we work with different people in bespoke ways because that's the chicken shed way. And um, we can find activities that feel right for you to connect with you and your inclusion goals and your staff. And, and that can range from, say, a corporate patron of, of somebody um, giving us 5,000 a year to try out sort of like an entry level partnership, um, a range of engagement activities and credit on the website, but also some training um, uh, that Paul and Dave have talked about um, and the youth task force that you've seen and living letters. You can try all those things and then work on to sponsoring a, a program, which is usually about 10 to 15,000 a year and upwards. Or, or, or other people work with us and they say, we'd like to to work with you as our charity of the year this year. And that means that uh, whatever we do, whatever kind of staff activities we do or team building or bits of events, we will raise money for you and um, accumulate that, that fundraising over the year. So there's a whole range of things and, and people also give us in-kind support and pro bono support. Um, well, there's advertising. So just get in touch with me um, uh, on Gemma K at chickenshed.org.uk and we can, we can have a chat, um, but I think that's it from all of us and really want to take the opportunity to thank you for connecting with us. It means so much and really helps us to, um, to do the work we do 
Uh, so thank you. See you soon. <laughs>